our guest this evening is uh, Dr. Joseph Corton, um, very familiar to us here at the OEA. Uh, Joe is, is currently based over in New York. He's Director of Climate and Resilience with the Rockefeller Foundation, and he was previously a member of the Irish government's um, Climate Change Advisory Council. And of course, he was senior fellow with ourselves, the Institute of International European Affairs. Um, he also previously worked with the OECD, the National Economic Social Council, and with UCC. He's a frequent media commentator, and you'll have seen him in the New York Times, on BBC, Foreign Policy, Financial Times, The Atlantic, uh, Washington Post, to name a few. He's a graduate of Trinity College Dublin, uh, the London School of Economics, and he's a PhD in climate finance from UCC. So just in terms of format, Joe's going to speak to us for about 15 uh, minutes or so on COVID-19, climate change, and what next for the climate movement, and then we'll get into Q&A. So anybody who wants to join the Q&A, you can do so by using the Q&A function. That's on the bottom of your screen, and um, you can send questions into us throughout the session as they occur to you, or you can hang on till the end when Joe finishes his presentation. Um, so with that, Joe, I'd just like to say also that um, Joe will be speaking this evening in his own personal capacity. Um, the full event will go up on our YouTube channel once we finish up. And if you want to join in the conversation, you can using the, the handle at IIEA on Twitter. Uh, Joe, over to you. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, it's great to be back in Dublin, albeit under uh, slightly um, different circumstances than, than I was expecting. Um, yeah, so uh, good to see you and uh, good to reconnect with the IIEA. So yeah, I'd like to, as you said, talk today a little bit about the implications of COVID-19 for the, the climate movement. And as we know, this is a, a pandemic that spread with alarming speed. Over 7 million people worldwide have been affected. Global death toll is approaching half a million people. And lockdowns have imposed across the world. Um, according to the World Bank, uh, this will have a devastating impact, economic impact, as well as the health impact. So um, approximately 93% of countries are project projected to enter a recession in 2020. And the baseline forecast for the World Bank at the moment is a global contraction of about 5% uh, in GDP this year. So this is the deepest global recession in decades. And of course, there's huge uncertainty even around that figure. Um, you know, if there uh, could be a far more prolonged and deeper global recession, depending on what happens in the autumn with uh, wave twos, etc., of, of the pandemic. So this will obviously have a devastating impact on advanced economies. But I think um, when we think about uh, systemic shocks, um, be they arising from climate change or pandemics or, or anything else, it's always the most vulnerable and um, who bear the brunt. And so the World Bank, again, are estimating that an additional 71 million people could be pushed back into extreme poverty um, this year. And of course, Sub-Saharan Africa will be the hardest hit. But the latest data is also presenting a particular, particularly sobering picture for India, which is home to many of the world's poor. And so I suppose today what I want to talk about is what are the implications of this um, backdrop for the climate agenda. And I think it's fair to say that there's been two competing views and in the conversations I've been having with peers and with partners, there's been a sense of how should the climate movement respond to this uh, pandemic. And, you know, there's a, certainly I think a risk that, you know, the climate movement, if it doesn't um, step forward in the right way, that it could be perceived as being somewhat tone deaf to the current crisis. And so there's been two sharply divergent views in the conversations I've been having. So some people, experts and policymakers and activists, believe that we potentially should be deprioritizing climate action now, given the, the urgency of responding to these short-term issues. But others, I think, are taking um, a different view to suggest that you know, this is a unique kind of moment to uh, take action on the climate agenda for various reasons. And I think there is actually an element of Proof to both of those perspectives, and in actual fact, it's actually about timing. And I think it's important to distinguish between the short and the medium term when it comes to uh, the climate agenda. So I think it's true to say, actually, that in the short term, we do need to sort of take a back seat as a uh, climate movement and climate activists. And in the Rockefeller Foundation, we've been giving a priority to our testing action plan, our testing solutions group, and these are all um, responses to the health crisis. 
But the second near-term priority is to support relief efforts that ensure that essential human needs are met. Um, and most countries have advanced you know, fiscal and monetary policy responses, although in the wealthy world, obviously these responses have been better resourced than they have been in vulnerable and some emerging countries. Um, but most of these responses um, in the short term have been uh, focused on expanding social safety nets and protecting the most vulnerable wage support to preserve jobs, increased access to unemployment benefits, targeted cash flow for low income households, etc. But I suppose our thesis is that these short term responses will give rise to a different agenda in the medium term. Um, as soon as we enter this period of recovery, and that could happen um, perhaps towards the end of this year, perhaps towards the first half of 2021. And a key priority at this stage will be to avoid a prolonged economic recession in the long run, but it will also be a unique opportunity to address structural issues, including inequality, poverty eradication, but also the more slow moving climate emergency. Um, and I think it's important um, that we use this moment um, to address some of the vulnerabilities and fragilities that have been brought into plain sight um, by the current pandemic and climate change obviously is one of those um, issues. Um, so yeah and I suppose this is, I suppose we, I think we need to see this as a longer, in the longer term as an opportunity to reshape the economy um, and to make decisions that are not only in the short term interests, but also in the long, long term interests. Um, so before talking about how this directly relates to the climate agenda, I'd just like to paint a little bit of a background um, in terms of where we were before COVID. And I'm going to focus on uh, the climate and development agenda more so than the develop, uh, climate agenda for the developed world. And um, although I would say upfront that it is the developed world from a climate justice perspective, it needs to move fastest, and that includes climate laggards like Ireland, unfortunately, and like the US, where I'm, uh, uh, where I am at the moment. And we do have programs and initiatives that are focused on the rich world. But I'm going to focus on the emerging and vulnerable um, countries in, for the most part, in this presentation. So the baseline situation is that energy demand is growing across Asia and Africa, but 800 million people still have no access to electricity and approximately another 2 billion, up to 2 billion people could um, be considered to be living in energy poverty, so they don't have reliable access to cheap power and the power they have access to isn't enough to drive you know, economic development and human development to support human flourishing. So this growing demand for power, um, there's a race underway between coal and natural gas and renewables. And unfortunately, coal is still in pole position and according to the Global Energy Monitor, there's 500 gigawatt, 550 gigawatts of coal power planned, permitted, or under construction across Asia and Africa. But we know that coal is not the right answer for development or, or an environmental perspective. It's not the right answer for energy access because it's usually too, too expensive to build the transmission and distribution lines for customers who will only have initially at least a small demand and who don't have, um, the, who, who don't, who aren't an attractive proposition from a utility perspective. But it's also not the right answer to these hugely growing cities because coal um, is hugely financially risky as an investment proposition. 42% of the coal operating fleet at the moment is cash flow negative, and Carbon Tracker estimates that 72% of the current coal fleet will be um, unviable by 2030. So the idea of layering in um, massive investments into coal power against this backdrop makes no sense. And a lot of the reasons that, well, we can go into the, in the questions and answers why we are actually building all this coal if it is such a bad proposition from a an financial and economic perspective. And on the other side of the same coin, wind and solar PV are now the cheapest options for power across most of the world, two thirds of the world, most markets. Um, and the IMF has identified energy transition is a 2.3 trillion investment opportunity per annum. So the economic fundamentals move in only one direction. And this brings me to, cheap, to green fiscal stimulus. So green power is the cheapest, the least risky, the cleanest um, source of power. And so therefore, I think at a big picture level, 
we're seeing a completely new development pathway and a development opportunity opening up for emerging and vulnerable countries. They don't need to follow in the pathway of the 19th century development model, which was based on fossil fuels. And given the unprecedented scale of the crisis, um, we're going to have to, um, in my view, advance an equitable and a green um, recovery, which targets inequality, exclusion, and climate change in a fundamental manner. And green power is a great way of doing that. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, this is uh, there's been a huge amount of economic analysis which supports the proposition that this green development pathway is um, the most attractive uh, economically. Um, I would point you to a new climate economy report in 2018, which is one of the best I've seen, uh, which establishes that thesis. So the types of investments um, in wind, solar PV, hydrogen, transmission lines, battery storage, solar PV can help us to overcome this economic slump in the short term, but they're also investments in, the, in humanity's long-term future. Um, and so one of the key arguments here for why the green pathway is better is that these investments in green technologies tend to be far more labor intensive. So if you spend 1 million on a green, the green economy, you create probably about three times the number of jobs as you would create um, in the fossil fuel economy. And again, there's been a huge amount of analysis on the kind of labor intensity of the green economy versus the green economy. And that's why you find leaders like um, uh, Kristalina Gorgiev from the IMF or Fatih Girov from the um, International Energy Agency who are all pushing this proposition of a green recovery. It's because it makes sense from a development perspective and from a climate perspective. So I just want to say a little bit um, more about which areas of the green economy um, are attractive, are particularly attractive. And there was a survey conducted by um, the, uh, who was it again, uh, the Oxford uh, School of Sustainability, um, a guy, Hepburn, and he interviewed 231 finance ministry officials, central bankers, economists, etc. And what he discovered was that yes, the green economy um, was considered the most attractive option uh, from a recovery perspective. And the, the key areas that they identified were renewable energy assets, like I said, uh, storage, uh, green hydrogen, grid modernization, and CCS technology. I'm not so sure about CCS myself, but that's what came across in this study. And they also identified building energy efficiency um, as a highly labor intensive um, area, which delivered multiple benefits. And they also um, identified education and training um, to build the uh, workforce for these opportunities as an, an important um, supporting, uh, supporting opportunity. And finally, they identified natural capital investments, so the likes of afforestation or nature-based solutions um, uh, approaches to sequestering carbon as another labor-intensive and climate-friendly approach to putting people back to work. Um, and finally, uh, investing in R&D is a lot, clean energy R&D is a longer term opportunity. Um, I think in, in vulnerable and rural contexts, um, I think what's important is um, probably less important, but in developed country contexts, we still have a, an important innovation agenda that we need to meet with uh, some proportion of the stimulus funds. And so lastly, I would say a lot of this evidence also comes from ex post analysis. It looks from the South Korean fiscal stimulus of 2009, which was very heavily focused on the green economy, as was the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, also in 2009. And both of those have been subject to you know, fairly rigorous analysis. So we know that this works from past experience as well. Um, and so, you know, just finally, a few words on the US. I mean, the same logic applies here to the US. In fact, what we're seeing is you need huge subsidies to support the ongoing, uh, particularly in the coal sector, but also in the oil and the gas sector. These, you know, these, these are, uh, you know, subsidy, um, these, these are industries that need to be undergirded with subsidies right now. Um, and I think from the US perspective, what we need to do is we need to envisage um, the openings that will arise on the political agenda, hopefully post November 2020, and we need to have pragmatic, innovative ideas 
that have been rigor rigorously assessed on the table when the next window of opportunity opens up for green fiscal stimulus, and that's something that in the foundation we're thinking about, and we have quite a bit of thinking done on that. And um, so lastly, I would say when this recovery effort is finished, I think there is another implication for the climate movement. I think what we've seen is the, the current international architecture, which is essential for the likes of a pandemic response, but also essential for climate change, it's not really fit for purpose. International cooperation and de development, the institutions that were set up um, post-World War II are not fit for purpose in an interconnected and globalized 21st century. And I think, you know, eventually we're going to get to a period of reflection where we have to really do a bit of an assessment, how did the likes of the UN or WHO or these other institutions, how did the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank and the IMF, who, who some would argue are performing better, how did they perform and what are the lessons we learn, we, we can learn for climate protection? Because as we know, we need to engender cooperation between lots of different countries and to get anywhere on climate change. And I think that there's lessons from COVID-19 that we can learn for climate action. And I suppose, you know, in the 21st century, we increase population density, the growth of megacities, the destruction of natural ecosystems. These are factors that have made the COVID-19 pandemic more likely, but these are also the factors that um, underpin climate change. And so that's another uh, factor that we need to consider. We need to prepare for a world where systemic crisis and catastrophic disruptions are a feature of the system and not a bug, not an aberration. Um, and I think, therefore, what we learn from the current crisis uh, will be essential in terms of um, how the human family proceeds over the next 100 years um, and could, in fact, be uh, critical to our flourishing, perhaps even our survival. Um, and you, you guys probably read what our daddy Roy um, said about this, but it, it really struck me um, at the end of her Financial Times op-ed from a few months ago, um, and I'll leave you with a quote from her. So she said, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It's a portal, a gateway between the, our world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. So I'll leave it there. Very happy Thanks very there. much, Joe. Um, very detailed to begin with and then very big picture system change stuff to finish with to, to get the the conversation going for the Q&A. So uh, I'll kick off Joe, maybe with a couple of questions and I'll just say now, just a reminder to, to uh, our people tuning in, if you do want to ask a question, just just pop it in in written form using the, the Zoom Q&A function there at the bottom and I'll, I'll fill them over to Joe then. Um, Joe, I mean, this this obviously, I mean, the COVID-19 pandemic is, 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 is completely uh, unprecedented, but you know, there's always been talk of reassessing at crisis moments and, you know, using this crisis as an opportunity. I mean, people have fallen asleep at the amount of times they've heard that. Um, John Berrigan, um, very senior Irish official in the European Commission, Director General of DG FISMA now, he was on talking about green financing and he said, you know, this is the moment, you know, you know, we cannot not take this opportunity, he said. Mm -hmm. And he said, and look, I've been around long enough to, to hear that cliche, but I'm telling you, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. this is widespread. So can you just sort of talk to us maybe a little bit about why this is the moment? This seems to be the time when everyone says, okay, now we'll actually um, pull ourselves together and, and, mm -hmm. and build back better, so to speak. Uh, can, you, can you just talk a little bit about why this is the mm -hmm. breaking point? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the future is always inherently uncertain, and it's you know, you know, and how we act now determines you know the world we will live in. I think I didn't talk about the EU. It's funny since I moved to the US and since I started working for the Rockefeller Foundation, we have a very development-focused agenda across all of our programmatic activities. So um, my world has been slightly more focused on US and emerging and vulnerable countries. But having said that, I think the, the EU is still 
just a shining beacon on a hill to the world um, from where I'm sitting. And the kinds of steps they're taking both to foreground um, green, the green economy in nation state and EU level fiscal stimulus plans has been remarkable and it is being noticed um, and that leadership isn't you know isn't going to waste it is being noticed and it is inspiring a lot of people and it's showing people around the world what is possible uh, and when you get into the when you get into the green finance debate again this is a huge opportunity for the EU to use some of the tools, the heuristics, the screens and um, for assessing investment flows, assessing the sustainability of investment flows, to put those to practice, you know, and to, uh, so it, the, the green uh, finance or sustainable finance plan um, developed this taxonomy and so now is a chance to put that to, to the test. And so, so I suppose one other thing I would add is that What's different this time is that the economic fundamentals have completely shifted. You know, and Goldman Sachs released a report, you know, there's reports coming out every day, but Goldman Sachs released a report the other, the other day saying that, it was yesterday actually, saying that, you know, the coal is dead anyway in terms of economic fundamentals, just like completely and utterly dead. And but what this report was saying was that oil and gas were also significantly on the back foot and because of underlying economic fundamentals. What's been critical, and this is something that everybody has a stake in, it hasn't been carbon pricing, right? The US has completely failed to get a carbon price across the line on numerous occasions. What it's been is when an investor wants to get to access capital for a coal project, he's being um, charged such a huge risk premium that actually that risk premium is the equivalent of having a between 40 and 80 dollar carbon tax. So in Ireland, as you know, our carbon tax is what, mid 20s, right? So the risk premium, the additional risk premium that an investor is being charged to, to support a fossil fuel project is so much higher than a clean energy project right now. And that's why is that? It's because of the divestment movement. It's because politicians have tried and failed to get carbon tax over the line, but they keep on saying they're going to keep on trying. It's because of pipeline protesters. It's because of the Sierra Club initiative, which has brought an end, which has brought a premature end to dozens of coal plants across the US. It's because of every single individual who has taken action, who has protested, who is, it's because of Greta Thunberg. It's, it's a bottom-up theory of change rather than saying we're going to do this with a carbon tax. So between that sort of level of consciousness that is permeated across the financial system and between the kind of policy measures and between, between just the economic fundamentals, you know, this moment can really be an inflection point for the green economy. So you would, I mean, say it is a symptom of the of the of the climate moment in terms of the mass protests and just you know it all coming together at mm. this particular point it's, it's really meant that you know you've got finance on board the politicians on board the people on the streets yeah. and it's just all sort of reached mm. this point now where in the middle of this pandemic people are saying we can't go back to what we we were just in you know that mm. wasn't working i mean you're talking there about the you know, the, the post-World War II institutions um, essentially mm -hmm. failing to address this issue. So a um, couple of questions coming in, I'll get to them now. Um, one question from um, Afrique was asking about um, the green energy better option financially um, because it's so labour intensive, would these jobs not just be very short term and be gone is the question she was asking. So it's not sustainable jobs. Uh, development that's just uh, here today, gone tomorrow. What was what's the sort of research saying on that? Yeah, so the whole idea of a fiscal stimulus, the whole like economic rationale. I'm loving that second question, by the way. I can't wait to get to that one. Um, so uh, the the whole rationale of a fiscal stimulus is that the output of the economy is trapped below its the equilibrium is below its equilibrium level. So government has a rationale for. Um, intervening and so the whole objective is to scale up opportunity to create jobs in the short term so yes like if you build a wind energy farm and um, you know the, the construction phase will be the, the first couple of years and um, where you're doing your project planning and then eventually your construction before you get into the operation stage 
will be the bit that creates jobs. Same with solar panels, etc. And um, the difference is that in a solar project compared to, let's say, a coal project, you need more labor, you know, for a longer period of time to get the same amount of energy, and the operational costs are zero. So you're not shoveling tens of millions every year into coal. Your, you know, your your marginal cost of operation is lower. So it do, it you know obviously having investing in cheap things that generate a better return is better for the economy than investing in you know expensive things that have a really poor return and that are highly financially risky so you know in the medium term this should also you know be better in the you know for you know for the, lot of the medium term economic growth prospects of the economy but the last thing i would say is that we do need to invest in smart R&D to ensure that we continue in the medium term to sort of progress in a you know economically optimal way. It's not just about meeting the short term need, but the immediate priority is short term need. It's the it's the tens of millions of people who are unemployed across the world. They don't care right now if their job is going to be for two years or for six months. They just want work, and that's what the green economy and green fiscal stimulus that's the problem it's designed to meet. Okay, another question here um, from our economics researcher, Killian Rossi. Um, and he asks about the, the novel, The Overstory, and just, um, you know, climate change and environmentalism. He wants to know, is there a better novel than that on, on that topic, or, or what, what your thoughts are? I haven't read one. Um, it's the best thing I've read in years. And, I mean, I feel like... I don't know, maybe um, uh, I'd love to hear actually from um, the participants and maybe it's not a representative sample, but I feel like what that novel represented to me was there is an environmental awakening, you know, that we are starting. And if you hear what Richard Powers um, himself says, he said that the, the, the type of novel, which was man versus nature, right, which was... Um, Moby Dick would be the class example, or maybe to a lesser extent, The Old Man in the Sea, but I think Moby Dick. We stopped, novelists stopped writing that kind of novel. It was one of the, tr the three great ca categories of novels because we had essentially tamed nature, we had won. And now nature is biting back. And now this kind of man nature kind of war dynamic, disharmony is bubbling up into the kind of collective consciousness again. And I thought that this novel was really kind of meeting that moment. Um, and maybe it's just because it's my world, but I thought like this was the beginning of a sort of an amazing kind of awakening of a kind of, of the need for a more balanced relationship between man and nature. It just, it's such a brilliant piece of work. It blew my mind. I would encourage everyone to read it. It's probably a little bit hard to get into, um, you know, the first 80 or 90 pages, but if you stick with it, I think it's it's really uh, rewarding. But I'd love to hear from Killian uh, if he has any other recommendations, because I'm always looking for a, a good L kind of nature novel, um, you know, uh, to, to get stuck into. Grant, I must pick it up with him and get, get him on to you if he has any recommendations. Um, another question here, Joe, I think on the last point you're making about, you know, the failure of multilateral institutions really to address this 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 crisis uh, from Karen Ferris. Um, Joe, you've talked about how multilateral institutions were used to uh, structure solutions to past crises. Uh, can we really hope to build global consensus on how to approach the recovery, particularly from a climate perspective, in a post-pandemic era when we've seen more of a retreat to nationalism, attacks on global bodies like the WHO, um, you know, less multilateralism when we're facing an ever common global threat. So, I mean, do you just want to pick up, I was going to ask sort of a similar question, um, you know, in this overhaul of the, of the, of the international order that you, you picture, uh, what would replace it? Um, so, sort of twin, twin questions there for myself and Karen. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think, Karen, you're, you're dead right. That, um, there's a need, you know, there's, there's a need there, whether that need is being met. I think we're going to need to go through some election cycles before there's any prospect of really addressing this need. And, um, you know, the US is still so important to the international order. And it goes without saying that, you know, leadership 
isn't being provided at this moment when it's most needed. In fact, you know, the, the international institutions and the international order, the EU, the WHO, the UN itself is being scapegoated um, by national leaders. We saw Bolsonaro follow Trump's lead as well in this respect. And um, so it's, um, I suppose the reality is it could go either way, you know? You know, I think that it's any thinking person uh, who's looking at this situation would identify the need for more international collaboration, more cooperation, more joint um, initiatives. Um, you know, just even from the perspective of, you know, uh, controlling a pandemic and, you know, uh, meeting, thinking about spillover effects and, you know, how they can be managed collaboratively or, you know, the one area where I think we have seen really positive international collaboration is on the scientific aspect. Like scientists just tend to be very internationalist in their view. And, you know, you've seen a huge amount of cross, um, cross national collaboration between these teams um, in terms of developing vaccines. And that's been really encouraging. Of course, I know that some of you may be saying, well, when these vaccines get kind of uh, developed, there's going to be this unseemly kind of rush to make sure that, you know, one country over another gets up first. But I think, you know, there are really positive signs there around um, how scientists are kind of, scientists in some ways are the best of us, you know, that they, they really do see the kind of big picture, they really do sort of want to collaborate, they're very mission kind of driven. And uh, so that has been one positive sign, but I absolutely accept um, what you're saying about the, the sort of clash of reality um, you know, and the rise of nationalism with the kind of world we need to build and you know that is a it's a big problem and, it, and in some ways it can only be it can only be solved at a national level first you know and step one is november 2020 and um, and if we don't get that you know then we're really just going to be all scratching our heads let's be very honest and um, in terms of the kinds of institutions like again i'm biased um but you know i think the kinds of collaborations that are engendered between nation states, between the EU, you know, forms a model. I mean, this is obviously not going to work anytime soon at an international level, but, you know, we need kind of structured international collaboration between member states. And, um, you know, I think on a micro level, we can look at the kind of mandates of the likes of the World Bank and the IMF and the international and the, the, the likes of the development finance institutions, the African Development Bank, the Asia Development Bank, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Fund. Um, all of these, I think, can be doing more, particularly in service of the green economy and green investment, although their mandates are changing. I think more can be done. Um, and I um, can't remember, there's probably more to be said, but. Uh, that's grand, grand. Well, you mentioned there, Joe, you know, and I've heard you, you know, previously discuss this, um, the window opportunity, and you talked about a couple of election cycles. Can I just ask, maybe we're sort of moving a little bit off your, your area of expertise now on climate, but I mean, are you optimistic uh, about these, you know, the changes that need to happen at a national level? You know, you've talked about the climate moment and the grassroots mm -hmm. ground up approach. Um, do you think that culminates ultimately in, in political change? And are you hopeful or are you, are you a bit more pessimistic? Um, I'm, a, I'm always an optimist and, you know, look, the trends are, if you're talking specifically about the US picture, you know, the trends are very, very positive. But, the, you know, the powers that be will do absolutely anything. You know, anything will go to any lengths to maintain the status quo. And you can see that manifest in any number of ways, you know, from political donations to um, gerrymandering to voter suppression, um, you know, and of course, inherently the system itself gives a huge electoral college advantage to um, the current administration. And so, um, so there are definite risks, but you know, the, the moment we're in at the moment, I mean, 
the, the murder of George Floyd has been an absolutely incredible moment here, like an incredible moment, a really, really profound moment that I think goes well beyond, you know, the systemic racism um, and the, uh, you know, the original sin of the US, which is slavery, although it, it, it heavily relates to, to, that, to that debate, but it's, I think it's, a, it's almost like a just a letting off of frustrated energy um, from, you know, progressive um, independence um, center, center, center minded people who are just, you know, pushing back against this kind of nationalist scapegoating um, agenda that's um, that's just been so in our faces for the last three and a half years. So there's just a kind of an unreal energy, an unbelievable energy, and it's it's actually a really interesting time to be in the U.S. for that reason. You know, with being working within a, um, I'm lucky to work within a foundation that really cares about these issues, and it's been so interesting to have these conversations, these difficult, awkward conversations with colleagues um, from across a wide diversity of backgrounds. Um, and as an Irish guy to, you know, not necessarily have the language to not know how to talk about it. And yet to be allowed to say that has been amazing. Say, look, I don't know, I don't have the language to talk about this. I'm scared I'm gonna step on a landmine. Um, and just to listen and learn you know, from people, uh, from my black colleagues, especially, um, to learn from their experiences. Um, it's been amazing. It's been a really interesting experience. It's been a privilege as well to kind of be here and to witness that. I was saying to you, Dara, just before we started, there was literally a uh, Black Lives Matter protest right out. I live in Brooklyn um, in Clinton Hill, uh, a fairly residential area. And there was just, a, you know, we've had so many protests, you know, going down our, our avenue, Washington Avenue. Um, over the last few weeks, um, and, and as I said to you, there's one just before just before this event started a big uh, protest kind of parked outside the house. Um, so uh, I, was, I was concerned they might have a bit of background noise, but they, they moved on. Grant. Um, a more political question then, just in terms of you know the specifics of the, the upcoming uh, US election, the presidential election. Um, do you have any sort of uh, thoughts on this? A question from Owen O'Keefe uh, at the IAEA. Um, he wonders, do you have any thoughts on, on Joe Biden's proposed climate plans and, and, and how they might uh, sort of swing the US in the direction from, from the current administration? Yeah, I was actually very impressed with Joe Biden's climate plan, to be perfectly honest. I think he got a lot of the you know, Obama admin folks to write it. It was particularly strong when it came to the international dimension, climate cooperation, how to engender cooperation, how to show leadership on the international stage. Um, it was also quite ambitious on the domestic front, you know, very ambitious on the domestic front. Now the advocates and the, um, we'll say the, the Green New Deal folks found plenty in it to criticize. Um, and I know that um, AOC and uh, one of the more mainstream folk, one of the more mainstream senators, John Kerry, actually, I think maybe, have been brought together by the Biden campaign to kind of to draft a, an official climate position. But I actually looked through all of the candidates' climate proposals in detail, and there was literally nobody who wasn't like presenting and man the barricades climate agenda, you know, so it's across the board on the kind of democratic front and, to, you know, this is a, you know, a serious crisis that needs to be, that demands an urgent response. Um, and so I think that, you know, we will see um, un, under the Obama, or under a Biden administration, we would see a very kind of proactive climate agenda. And another one here, Joe, from, from Killian, uh, economics researcher at the Institute, and um, it's, it's on the topic broadly of, of, of greenwashing. Um, you know, the Commission's Circular Economy Action Plan um, commits a tackle on greenwashing, but the Commission itself um, has been accused by MEPs of not following its own advice, according to reports in the FT yesterday, um, appointing BlackRock's financial markets advisory to avoid an integrating sustainability ESG factors into the EU's banking regulations, you know. So, 
I know you're not across the detail of the specifics of that EU case, but how how serious an issue more broadly is is greenwashing in in, in your view? It's you know more broadly, it's it's a huge issue. You know, I attend the Climate Week summit here, and it's like, you know, um, is this am I on the record or on the record? <laughs> you're on the record, Joe, but uh, you're speaking in your own capacity. <laughs> well. Um, like a less juicy answer. You know, I hear financial. I hear major financial institutions who are bankrolling. You know, the most hard to reach, carbon intensive projects in the world, in the Arctic. You know, shale gas, coal, and deep sea oil. You know, are standing up at Climate Week talking about how they've changed their light bulbs. So, um, you know, there. It's it's an absolutely enormous issue. It's a huge issue, and that's why we need government intervention, we need government regulation, we need central banks to set the agenda, we need financial regulators to act. Um, and, you know, because the industry itself is, capital is like water, and water and capital always flow to the area of least resistance. And the area of least resistance for an investor is the area with the highest return that has the lowest risk. So in order to change an investor's perspective, you have to either affect the return or affect the risk, you know? And a lot of the work that, you know, I, I haven't actually been focused on this very much recently, but a lot of the work we've done in the past has been looking at the risk end of the equation. Um, and so, you know, that's the part that everyone can influence. That's the part that, you know, the people, you know, who lobbied BlackRock, for example, to, um, for, Larry, for Larry Fink to include climate change as the central proposition in his letter to investors earlier in the year and um, you know anyone who's protested a pipeline anyone who's been involved in the investment campaign you know anyone who's lobbied the Irish government to um, outlaw offshore you know oil and gas exploration of the Irish like all of those things they increase the risk premium for investors who are trying to make a quick book off fossil fuels um, and so I actually think I rambled far off the original question, but I think, you know, the issue is that, you know, greenwashing is a huge issue and that we need government regulation, financial regulation and action from uh, central banks and monetary authorities to address that. And it needs to be consistent and coordinated, particularly between the EU and the US. Very good. Yeah. Um, and Joe, look, I think we're coming towards the end here now, but I think um, I'll take it, obviously, that maybe you're not um, as, as, as clued in and following what's going on here in Ireland. But I mean, I'll just finish with a question on, on government formation talks here. The um, programme for government was, was released this week by Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil and the Greens. It's going to green members now. Um, checking my Twitter feed, it's it's uh, all the the green conference is going on at the moment. All the different mm -hmm. uh, representatives are up speaking in favour or against it. Um, have you had a chance to, to to look at any of the headline items and and, and what what are your thoughts on it? Um, and and how would you mm -hmm. see that that government uh, progressing the climate movement in Ireland? Yeah, I mean, I think that the. You know, the headline um, goals are incredibly ambitious. And I think if the Greens don't jump at this opportunity from a climate project perspective, they'll be potentially missing a once in a lifetime, you know, a once off opportunity to really affect, you know, energy transition and climate change in Ireland. Let's be honest, our performance has been pretty deplorable. Um, we're one of the slowest um, countries in the EU to get off and um, to get out of the blocks. We've made some good progress in the power sector, to be fair, but you know, across the rest of the economy, the progress has been incredibly slow. I mean, if I was writing a climate plan, a 7% annual reduction in emissions is as ambitious as you could possibly conceive, you know, without being considered completely unrealistic. Um, you know, the two to one um, spending between transport and roads is huge, and it's something that I've been um, advocating for, for a while, you know, a lot of the targets we already have on retrofit and electric vehicles are so incredibly demanding and they need, there are forces within government who are opposing those targets on a very spurious basis. Um, and I think we really need a political voice at the table which is advocating for that transition and making the case. And to be honest, not accepting some of the, you know, fairly shoddy cost benefit 
approaches that I've seen propositions to uh, to stand in the way of some of these targets being achieved. Um, so yeah, I think it's a once in a lifetime opportunity and I would implore the Green Party membership not to let the enemy be uh, the, the perfect of the enemy of the good and to endorse uh, a program for government and hopefully take your seat at the table and influence decisions from the inside rather than kind of, you know, uh, shouting from the outside. Brilliant, Joel. Thanks very much for that. Just, just a final question here that's come in, just I think on the base of what you've just said there. Talking about that 7%, you know, being as ambitious without being unrealistic, can you just actually maybe talk us through what that would actually entail? I mean, given how, I mean, I don't know how detailed you want to go into here now, but uh, it's just a follow-up question from Owen asking, what, what, Owen O'Keefe, what, what would that actually mean for our lives? Um, you know, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave that one with you and then we'll finish up on that. Yeah, we'll put it this way, like I've looked at the most rapid decarbonisation that's ever been achieved by any developed country in the last 50 years. And it's actually the UK has achieved a 3% annual reduction in emissions uh, between, I think it was like maybe 2008 and 2018. France, when it was building out its massive nuclear fleet, also achieved a national 3% emissions reduction. So to achieve a 7% emissions reduction is just, we're talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands of energy retrofits in the building sector. So we're talking about investing 30 to 40,000 in each home or maybe a million homes in the country. We're talking about everybody driving an electric vehicle within the next five or six years and no more internal combustion engines. We're talking about, you know, a massive scaling up investment in the renewable sector and possibly achieving, you know, at least a 70% uh, renewables penetration by 2030. And we're talking about, um, you know, to be honest, none of this can be achieved without fairly significant, um, what's the political way to put it, uh, um, land use planning in the agriculture sector, which, you know, means, you know, taking, you know, massively loss making kind of um, beef production and, you know, using those subsidies to, you know, uh, support farm livelihoods and incomes in a way that's, you know, far more climate friendly, be it, you know, supporting and um, biodiversity, ecosystem services, afforestation, whatever it might be. So we're going to have to address all the sectors of the economy, agriculture, buildings, transport, and energy, and they all have to be addressed in a fundamental manner. And it has to be done at a scale that has never been seen before anywhere in the world. There you go. Um, yeah. I think that's that so question. If the, want, uh -huh. if the Greens want more, if the Green Party membership want more than that, they really need to kind of check themselves because it's it's just not it's not coming from planet reality well i think the main the main issue that they have uh without speaking with the greens here obviously is that um they're saying that the majority of that will average out in the next five years from 2025 to 2030 so they're saying it's not a commitment for this this part of the government, but I mean, even mm -hmm. still, they do have in 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 set in stone the two to one on transport that you talked about, mm -hmm. um, and I mean commitments to lay the groundwork so that that massive mm -hmm. uh, unparalleled reduction over over each year can can happen. But um, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to be a very interesting space to watch. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll be watching from New York. We'll be watching from here and see what mm -hmm. actually happens. Uh, what's your, Joe, what's what's can I just ask you, what's your read, political tea leaves, and um, what, what's your sense of what the Green membership will go for? I mean, they need a two-thirds majority, don't they? They need two-thirds, yeah. Look, I mean, I think um, some very prominent members of the Greens have been out uh, talking against this. Um, you know, a couple of the TDs in the parliamentary party abstained, and they've been at this uh, convention today talking against this. So I don't know is the honest answer. I don't think anybody does. I think it's a bit of an unknown because the Greens membership has spiked so much in the last two, three years. Lots mm -hmm. of influx of new members. Um, I think the reading was about 2,600 members signed up to vote. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big number. So um, I think I think anybody who tells you know exactly what's going to happen is, is lying to you. you know, that everyone's, everyone is just a bit of a wait and see. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we'll, we'll have to see what the crack is. <laughs> Thanks very much, Joe, right. for, for taking Thank the time this evening. Um, lots of questions that we got through. And uh, look, we look forward to setting up another YPN for July. And then we'll take a break in August and come back in September with, with a couple more. So thanks very much for joining us this evening. Joe, yeah. cheers. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.